Let me first tell you what I'm not going to try to do. I'm not going to try to explain why the bad things happen to good people. I'm not here to explain a tragedy, an unthinkable tragedy, an unthinkable loss. Yes, we know that Hashem is perfect in all of His ways, but I don't have to be Hashem's defense attorney to explain that overly. We are hurting, we are in shock, we are grieving, and um, somehow we know that Hashem knows what He's doing, but we know that with our faith, not with our minds. Right now our minds are broken, and our hearts are broken. And as Rabbi Wallach mentioned earlier, the idea that a shliach's family would be sitting shiva during the week of Kinas Hashluchim, the international conference of the Rebbe's emissaries, is, is, is literally unthinkable. This is the week, once a year, when all of the Rebbe's shluchim from all over the world come back to Crown Heights to renew their dedication to their mission. It's a time of incredible joy. And the Rashliach should be murdered this very week, and that his family should be sitting Shiva, and that by extension the entire family of Shluchim, of thousands of Shluchim all over the world, and really the entire Klal Yisrael all, all over the world to be sitting Shiva is unthinkable. Of course, It's impossible not to think about the fact that there are echoes of 16 years ago right now. The Kinnis HaShluchim of Tavshin Samach Tess, 2008. The Kinnis had just finished. I remember very clearly I was giving a Tanya Shir. I was actually... Was, uh, I was giving a Tanya share in Bayside, Wisconsin, which that's where I was uh, teaching at that time. I'd just come back from the, from the Kinnis, and we got news that we should say extra to Hillim because something happened with the Shluchim in, in Mumbai. And then, obviously, the events unfolded and the tragic outcome was revealed that the Shluchim and their guests at the Chabad house in Mumbai, had been targeted, had been massacred. We had just come back from the high, from the elation of the Kinnis HaShluchim, of the, the global conference of the Rebbe's emissaries. And then we came crashing down to, to, to receive this tragic news. And now it's 16 years later and the Kinnis, the conference is starting in just a couple of days. And we're in mourning again, again for a shliach. And the connection between Rabbi Kogan's family and the Holzberg family is also obviously impossible to ignore. Rabbi Kogan's wife, Rifki, her uncle was Gabi Holzberg. And uh, Yes, as Rabbi Wallowick mentioned, I also had heard that under his chuppah, Rabbi Kogan wore the kapota of Rabbi Holtzberg. And now to think that they're both victims of being murdered for no other reason than that they represent the Jewish people is, again, just too much for the brain, too much for the heart. And so, yeah, I'm not, I'm not here to make it make sense. It doesn't make sense. I was watching the funeral today. So they brought Abik Hogan's body to Eretz Yisrael and specifically to the village of Kfar Chabad. And um, it was raining, just started raining out of nowhere. And they're standing in front of the replica of 770. Obviously, 770 is the iconic building 
in Brooklyn, the world headquarters, Lubavitch world headquarters, but there are 770s all over the world, and one of them is in Kfar Chabad. So they were standing in front of the 770 replica in Kfar Chabad. And I couldn't help but think about the link to events that took place in Kfar Chabad many years ago where the Rebbe gave direct guidance. And that guidance from the Rebbe holds true today just as much as then. And so I want to look to the Rebbe's words of comfort and guidance that took place then and use it as a directive for now. Again, not to try to explain the tragedy, but to give us direction where to put the intensity of our, of our feelings that we're, that we're having right now. So, the village of Kfar Chabad was founded in uh, 1949. And just a few years after the founding of the village, basically these were um, immigrants from the Soviet Union, Chabad Chassidim, who had been victims of communist oppression under Stalin's regime. And there were always, from the inception of the village, there were always raids from terrorists. That was a constant problem. But um, <coughs> In Tovshin Tezvov, 5715, that would be equivalent to 1955, there was a murder of a young man. He was a very talented young man. He was a teacher. His name was Yisrael Arya Dubruskin. And I think he was 20 years old. He was a teacher at the, the trade school, which the Rebbe founded, the Bet Sefer Lemelacha. Mostly it was Moroccan immigrant students who would learn part of the day and they would be trained in a, in a trade part of the day. And this Bacher, this Yeshiva Bacher, was, uh, was their teacher. And Apparently he took a, a bus or a train to Lud, and then he walked the rest of the way and he took a shortcut, I think, and terrorists kidnapped him. And very similar to the story that just happened now, he was missing for many days. There was a search party and they feared the worst, but they couldn't find a body right away. And then eventually they found him in an orchard. He'd been murdered in an orchard. Actually, the one who found the body was the future Rav of Bnei Brak, Meshi Yehuda Leib Landa. And obviously this was, was devastating. But I want to explain something to you. Um, and we forget this. Terrorism is a word and it has a meaning. We use the word so much we forget what it means. Terrorism isn't just violence. There's a lot of different types of violence. Terrorism is specifically the use of violence to instill terror. So it was not only that this young man was murdered, which was an unfathomable loss for his family and for his community, but what proceeded to happen, which was entirely the intent and the design and the purpose of terrorism was that panic set in in the entire village of Kfar Chabad and there was a, a movement to abandon the Kfar. They said it's just not safe. It's just not a safe place. Now this event happened the fourth night of Hanukkah, sadly enough, tragically enough, on the on a night when we're supposed to be adding in light 
a light was snuffed out. The Rebbe responded to the village of Kfar Chabad in a letter that's printed in the Igros Kedesh Chelik Yod, volume 10 of the Rebbe's letters, on uh, Yud Shvat. Now Yud Shvat, as many may know, is the yard site of the Rebbe's father-in-law, the Rebbe's Rebbe. And it was a very busy day for the Rebbe. The Rebbe spent the entire day praying and at the Eihel, at the resting place of his father-in-law, and then came back and there was a Fabrengen and it was an incredibly busy day, but somehow during that day a letter was sent to the village of Kfar Chabad and in the letter the Rebbe addresses the fear that they have that they want to abandon the Kfar. I just want to point out what the Rebbe said and what the Rebbe did not say. The Rebbe did not attempt to explain the tragedy. The Rebbe addressed the emotional impact that the tragedy was having on the people. Okay? So that's why I'm taking the approach that I'm taking. I'm not here to offer any type of, of deep explanation. I don't think it's even appropriate at this point when we are in such deep pain. But I do think it's important to realize that acts such as were committed against Rabbi Kogan and which unfortunately have been committed against Jews throughout history are committed for a purpose it's to make us feel discouraged, to make us feel unsafe, to make us feel insecure, to make us full of self-doubt. It's to make us lose hope. That's the purpose of attacks like this. So in the letter that the Rebbe wrote to Kfar Chabad, he didn't try to explain Hashem's ways. But what he did do is he addressed the impact that the fear would have on the people and how to address that. So the Rebbe writes, as I said, this is in the Igros Kedish Chelik Yod, which you, you, can, you can learn the, the original text. <clears throat> the Rebbe writes about three incidents that took place in three respective generations. The Alta Rebbe, the Mitla Rebbe, and the Tzemach Tzedek. In other words, the first, second, and third Rebbes of Chabad. And in this letter, the Rebbe quotes from letters that each of these Rebbes, each of his predecessors, wrote on different occasions where there was fear and there was, there was talk about leaving a place because of trauma that had happened there. So the, the, the Alter Rebbe's letter, the Alter Rebbe is writing to a, to a chassid, uh, Rabbi Yosef Zeravitzer, who had had a fire. And the Alter Rebbe says that there's a saying that that after a fire, one becomes, becomes rich. So what does that mean? Now, people today, you all laugh at that in the Siyah because you have fire insurance. But this is long before fire insurance. So the Alter Rebbe proceeds to explain that Alpi Kabbalah, Kabbalistically, you have Chesed, you have Din, and you have Rachmim. Chesed is the right vector, which is kindness. Din is the left vector, which is severe judgment. Rachmim is compassion, that's the center. And the order of things is right, left, center. So when something happens that is an expression of din, of harsh judgment, the next thing that's going to happen is the rachamim, is the compassion. So the Alter Rebbe explains, you've already experienced the din, don't leave, stay there, and wait for the compassion. Similarly, the, then the Rebbe quotes a letter from the Mitla Rebbe. 
And similar circumstances, the Mitle Rebbe is writing to a town that experienced a fire. And he says the same thing, that Noch Reich, and he explains it actually even a little bit more, that it's not just that it goes right, left, center, kindness, severe judgment, compassion. The Mitle Rebbe explains it a little bit more, and he says, really, there was compassion hidden in the severe judgment all along, but it wasn't able to express itself. But once outwardly the severe judgment has been expressed, then the inner core of compassion is able to come out and you're going to experience divine compassion. And he says, so therefore, do not leave the same place because that's where your compassion is coming. So as much as it's counterintuitive, at least maybe from a psychological point of view, that you feel that this place is triggering you because you experienced a trauma there. Nevertheless, you have to let things work themselves out, Kabbalistically speaking, and don't leave this place because this is where the, the comfort and the healing is actually going to be sent. And then there's a letter from the Tzemach Tzedek, which the, the Rebbe quotes, saying essentially the same thing. And so the Rebbe tells the, the residents of, of Kfar Chabad, the place where you experience this pain is the place where you're going to experience divine compassion. Don't leave this place. Remain there. I was thinking about this. In 2024, almost 2025, we live in a global world today. We don't just relate to events that happen in our hometown. We have technology that informs us within seconds about events that happen at any spot on the globe. And the reality is when a Jew is targeted for, for terrorism in the United Arab Emirates, is the statement only to the local Jewish community, or is it a global statement? Well, I think the fact that we're all sitting here right now is a testimony to the fact that it is a global statement. In other words, the terrorists are trying to send a message to Jews all over the world. So in that sense, all of us have experienced the din. We've experienced the harsh judgment. We've all been terrorized, which is the intention of the act. Now, obviously, when something happens all over the whole world, you can't really leave the world. You can leave a, a, a place. You can move out of town. You can say, this place is no good. There's too many scary things happening. Let's, let's go somewhere else. But when the world feels unsafe, you obviously you can't relocate. I mean, I think Elon Musk wants us to go to Mars. But so far, you can't leave Earth, right? But that's precisely the point. That's precisely the point. That terrorism is trying to make the entire world feel unsafe. So there was din, there was harsh judgment that really affected the entire world. It stands to reason that the, the ensuing rachamim, the compassion, the divine mercy, is also equally going to be universal. It's going to be global. In other words, our human reaction to this event is to cower and to look for a safe place to hide. And that's a human reaction. But we have to be more spiritual. We have to be more connected to our faith. We have to have the view of infinity. Uh, we have to have a godly view. And that is that if we experience din, then we are about to experience rachamim. It doesn't justify the harsh judgments. Again, like I said, I'm not here to justify. But what it does is it tells us not to check out of reality, not to go hide ourselves, not to go numb ourselves, distract ourselves because the world feels like it's not a hospitable place, but 
rather the opposite. Keep your eyes open and be present because good things are unfolding. When I watched the funeral today in Kfar Chabad, so Rabbi Duchman, Rabbi Levi Duchman, who's the head shliach in the UAE, he spoke about the fact that when a tragedy happens, that our first response is silence. This we learned from V'yidem Aharon, that Moshe's brother, Aharon, Moses' brother, Aaron, when a tragedy befell him, he did not speak, he didn't try to explain it, he was silent, that the faithful response is silence. So Rabbi Duchman said that our response is silence, but then our response is action. So it's very interesting. Again, we're not here to explain it. What explanation would you like? I, I, I don't want an explanation, even if you have one for me. So initially, silence. But then action. And as Rabbi Duchman mentioned, that they're already beginning to build a new building called Bet Tzvi, which is the name of the Kaddish. And it also means, Tzvi also means splendor. So Bet Tzvi doesn't just mean the house named after Tzvi, it also means the splendorous house. In other words, the intention of the terrorists is to stifle our hopes and our positivity. And our response is to double down and to create more positivity in the world. We don't fight darkness. We turn on the light and the darkness disappears. That's always our approach. Think about this Kaddish whose life was taken. What was his purpose in this world? How did he live? 28 years old, a young married guy, living in the UAE, for what? For what? What's he doing over there? People ask that, by the way. What's he doing? Why was he even there? So first of all, let me explain to you, I've been there. I was there. I can tell you that when I spoke there, when I spoke in Dubai on a, on a Wednesday night, we had a bigger crowd <laughs> in Dubai than we have here in Cedarhurst, just to, to let you know. And it wasn't even the whole community, it was just young parents. I spoke at the nursery school. I just want you to understand what's happening there. It's a young, thriving Jewish community. People don't realize that. People think it's just business. There's a young, thriving Jewish community. There's a nursery school there. I spoke there at the nursery school on a Wednesday night, and we had the room packed, almost 100 young Jewish parents who are raising their children Jewishly in the middle of Dubai. And then, of course, then, there, then there's the capital of Abu Dhabi, which also has Chabad programs. So first of all, just understand what's going on there. There are Jewish people who are hungry and thirsty for a Jewish connection. Many of them didn't necessarily have so much uh, Jewish practice or Jewish education in the places where they come from. Everybody comes from somewhere else in the UAE. And something happens sometimes when you come to a new environment, you become more receptive. Or sometimes when you come to a place where um, you don't have your old support system, so you have to create a new support system. But whatever the reason is, there's a lot of receptivity to Judaism over there. And also I should mention that the government is incredibly supportive of it. The Emirati government and the Emirati people and the Emirati royal family are incredibly supportive of Jewish life. So it's a thriving community. So he goes there, and what is he going there to do? So you could say he's running a kosher store. He's running a kosher store. Okay. I want to tell you something. The first Chabad house in history, 
Avroham Avinu, our father Abraham, ran a grocery store. That's what he did. What did he do? He had this message he wanted to spread to the world called belief in God. And so he set up a nice tent and he filled it with nice food. And when people would come by, he would give them nice hospitality and he would talk to them and he would teach them about God in the middle of a desert. I mean, literally, this is what, this is what Tzvi was doing in the middle of a desert, kosher grocery, using that as his opportunity to connect to people, Jews and non-Jews, and to speak to them about belief and about making the world a better place. So his entire life was about this audacious idea that if we go out into the world and we actually meet people and we engage people, that we can spread faith throughout the entire world and we can create a revolution, a, re a revolution of consciousness where the entire world believes in God and is able to come together to live in harmony. That's what we call Mashiach. That's what we call the Messianic era. And that's the entire underlying purpose of every shliach who goes out. And this is what Tzvi was doing. So he continued the tradition that started from our father Avraham Avinu. And like Avraham Avinu, he was ready to give his life. And in the end, he did give his life. But the message to all of us the message to all of us is not why did it happen. The message is, are we ready to respond with the same dedication that this Kaddish had? Are we ready to live our lives meaningfully and to say that we're also shluchim, we're also emissaries, and we also believe in, in the possibility of, of perfection, of making the world a perfect place? And that instead of allowing the terrorism to make us lose hope in this project, our answer has to be we're going to double down and we're going to invest ourselves with even greater vigor into this project. And so as difficult as it is to do when we're mourning and we're grieving, but the Kinnas HaShlochem is an incredible opportunity for this because the Rebbe's emissaries from all over the world are about to converge in New York. And although I... I'm sure there will be weeping because we are humans and we have a heart and it's impossible not to feel human emotion and there will be grieving. But at the same time, I can tell you that the clarity of purpose that there will be at the Kinnis will be laser focused and it'll be because of this Kaddish, it'll be because of Tzvi because of his dedication and his example. And so when all the shluchim go back from the kinnis to their place, imagine how many mitzvahs are going to happen, how many more mitzvahs are going to happen than would have already happened. Think about how much more tefillin, how many more people bringing mikvah into their marriage, how many more people improving their, their adherence to, to kashris, or how many more people giving their Jewish children a Jewish education, or how many more people putting up a mezuzah. The explosion of mitzvahs that's going to come from this kinos is all a direct translation of looking at the example of this Kaddish, of Tzvi, and in some ways, I, I wonder if this is not the rachamim that follows the din. And that if the shluchim from all over the world return from this kinos with renewed focus and dedication, and the lay leaders who come as their guests return to their communities also with this renewed focus and dedication. And that becomes, that becomes contagious in each community. And each community where there's a Chabad becomes renewed and refreshed and rejuvenated with this, this focus on this end goal of perfecting the world. That is the greatest blessing. 
That is the greatest blessing that can occur. So again, I'm not here to explain Hashem's ways. I'm not here to retroactively agree on, a, on an exchange. But what I am saying is, I can make an agreement that I am going to live my life dedicated to the idea that we're here to perfect the world. See, the terrorists want to make us cower. They want to make us give up hope. And then we counter that, and often the rhetoric that you hear is, but we're going to survive. Well, actually, that's a zero-sum game. So they try to make you not survive, and your answer is that you're going to survive. So then it would have been better if they, the terrorists never existed in the first place, because then if no one's trying to take away your survival, then you got your survival. The response is not, yeah, but we're still here. Yeah, but we're going to survive. No, 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 no. The response has to be, we are going to transform the world. So, no, it's not just, we're still here, you couldn't get rid of us, we will survive. What's the point of that? The response has to be, you tried to threaten our survival, we will respond by perfecting the entire world, by bringing peace to all of humanity, by bringing God consciousness to every man, woman, and child in the world. And that's our goal, and that's what our prophets foretold. Contrary to the, to the rhetoric that you hear from people who either misunderstand Judaism or maliciously and willfully distort Judaism, our vision is a vision of a world that is safe and prosperous for all human beings, Jewish and non-Jewish. We call that Mashiach, the Messianic era. And we believe that we can bring about that era by dedicating ourselves and inspiring others to do acts of goodness and kindness. That is how Tzvi lived. He lived that way until his dying breath. That is how we have to be encouraged to live. I mentioned Avram Avinu earlier, the, our father Abraham. The Rebbe speaks about the Mesidus Nefesh of Avram, the sacrifice of Abraham. How Abraham was ready to give his life. In uh, the Rebbe's inaugural discourse, Bossi Legani, so the Rebbe speaks about first the Mesidus Nefesh of Rabbi Akiva. The Rabbi Akiva was, um, he lived during the, the persecution of the Romans, from the Romans. And he was warned not to teach Torah. And he continued to do so. And he was asked, why is he uh, tempting fate? Doesn't he know eventually he'll be caught? So he answered with an allegory. He said, once there was a fish swimming in the water and the fishermen were trying to catch the fish in their nets. And a fox came by and said to the fish, it's not safe for you in the water, come up on dry land with me. <laughs> Obviously the fox is trying to catch the fish. So the fish says to the fox, no thank you. If I'm not safe in the water, which is the place where I live, how much more <laughs> unsafe will I be if I come up on dry land with you? So Rabbi Akiva meant to say that, yes, it's true that I may be at risk if I continue to teach Torah. But if I leave it, that's like a fish leaving water. A Jew cannot leave Torah. So whatever the risk may be, this is, this is my home. And so he continued teaching, and they caught him, and they executed him. And when he was being executed, as he was dying, he said, Shema Yisrael. And his students were there, and they asked him, I mean, when you hear the story of it, you take for granted, I think, some of these details, that it's sort of a, 
has this legendary status in our minds, so you don't think about it in human terms. But somebody's being brutally tortured. To have the presence of mind to be able to say Shema Yisrael, to be able to pray, it's, it's, it's beyond normal. And they asked him, the students asked him about this. And he answered. He had the presence of mind to be able to hear their question, to be able to answer them. And he said to them, my whole life I'm saying Shema. And it says, You should love Hashem with all of your, your nefesh, with all of your soul. Which means even if He takes your soul. So I've been saying these words my whole life, and I was waiting for when it would actually happen. So now I'm actually getting to do it. I'm, the thing that I said so many times, I, now I'm finally fulfilling it. So Rabbi Kiva basically said that his whole life he was waiting for this opportunity. Now, when they came looking for him, he hid. It wasn't like he was trying to get himself killed. But at the same time, he understood that if it does happen, that this is a very noble thing to do. The Rebbe contrasts this with Avram Avinu. As high and lofty as the level Rabbi Akiva was, Avram Avinu's level is even loftier. Because Avram Avinu never even thought about the fact that what he was doing was a sacrifice. He didn't consider that he might lose his life doing what he was doing. He was just focused on his goal, and if in the course of doing his shlichus, he would lose his life, I guess that would happen, but that wasn't even a consideration, which was an even loftier level. We are all children of Avram Avinu. We have the spiritual DNA of Avram Avinu, so we have this, <coughs> this trait in us at least in potential, this ability to say, I'm so focused on the mission, the mission of bringing God to the world. I'm not looking to lose my life doing it, but whatever happens, I'm going to stay focused on the goal and nothing will deter me. Now, if you think about that, that sounds so abstract, like how do you even wrap your head around a concept like that? Talking about Avram Avinu, we're talking about someone who lived 4,000 years ago. But you're also talking about Tzvi Kogan, 28-year-old kid in our day and age who did the exact same thing. He didn't say, I'm going to go on Shlichus to get killed. Nobody says that. No Jew says that. He said, I'm going to devote my entire life to bring goodness to the world. Jews and non-Jews. That is my purpose. Whatever sacrifice I have to make is incidental. It's not my, not even really my, what I'm considering over here. And in the end, it was his fate, he was called upon to give his very life in the course of his shlichus, of carrying out his, his mission. But what I'm trying to bring across here is this idea that it's not his death that we're learning anything from. We're, we don't glorify his martyr's death. What we're learning from is the singularity of purpose and the focus on the ultimate goal with which he lived his life and which is our response. So again, I'll say for the fifth time, I'm not here to explain God's ways and I don't understand the tragedy and it doesn't make sense to me and even retroactively I wouldn't take it as a barter no matter what the payoff is. The whole thing is unthinkable. But what I can learn from here, what I can learn from here is that when forces 
converge to make us give up hope of our mission, our audacious mission to bring peace and prosperity to the entire world, our response has to be that we are even more focused on that goal than ever before. I want to encourage everybody that when you go about your day, that you think of yourself as a shliach, as an emissary. Every Jew is an emissary of Hashem to bring the word of Hashem, the message of Hashem to the entire world. That means in all of your dealings with Jews and non-Jews to imbue that interaction with some type of holiness, with performing a mitzvah, whether it's Shabbos candles or it's tefillin or giving tzedakah, giving charities, just simply putting a, a dollar in a, in, a, in, a, in a tzedakah box. But this has to be our focus. This is our only response. And we've experienced the din, the harsh judgment. We're ready to experience an explosion of rachmim, of divine compassion and mercy. An explosion of acts of goodness and kindness. So be ready. It's going to happen. It's going to happen now. There's too much converging all together for this not to happen. We have the life example of Tzvi. We have the Kinnis HaShluchim, the International Conference of the Rebbe's Emissaries coming together. All of this comes together to create the perfect storm of positivity where we can go from here to literally bring goodness to every single human being on the planet. Which was the job that Tzvi signed up for. And that really, the entire Jewish people signed up for. We didn't sign up to be a minority that hides, that creates its own ghetto, to insulate itself, to outlast the forces of negativity. Again, I said before, our, our response is not, oh, but we will outlast you, we'll, 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 we'll survive after you. That's not our response. Our mission is to be a light unto the nations, to teach goodness and morality and love for our fellow. No matter how the negative forces in the world attempt to characterize us, either by misunderstanding or by malicious misrepresentation, we stay focused on our goal. And our goal is nothing less than the perfection of the world. There's going to be a massive groundswell of good deeds in the world right now. It's already starting. Our choice right now is to be part of it. We can be traumatized by this terrorism and miss out on the wonderful stuff that's about to happen, or we can be galvanized by it and be leaders in this movement. Okay, all right, should hear good news very soon.